Um, welcome everyone to another IC Talk sponsored by the International Community of the Society of Professional Journalists. If you'd like, uh, please drop in the chat where you are joining from since we are all scattered about uh, the country and some international destinations on our computers. Uh, hi, my name is Haston Willis. I am the chair of SPJ's Freedom of Information Committee and a freelance journalist based in Atlanta, Georgia. I contribute to the Washington Post, uh, US News and World Report and the Atlanta Journal Constitution among other outlets. And I'll actually be moving uh, to the Washington area later on this year. And I'm, I'm uh, greatly honored to be hosting this important event tonight. SPJ's International Community is a group that encourages press freedom and cooperation among journalists, not just nationally, uh, but globally. We use these one-on-one -on -one conversations to dig a little deeper into issues affecting journalists around the world. Sometimes it's about press freedom and threats to independent journalists. And sometimes like today, it is with experts in a field that has local and global implications. We hope you, we hope you learn, grow, and take from today information that will help you and inspire you in your journalism going forward. Uh, the format tonight is simple. The guest and I will have a conversation and I encourage you to ask questions as the discussion goes on. Uh, a couple of notes, please use the Q&A feature. If you want me to read the question for you, please indicate that in your question. Uh, otherwise, SPJ International Community Co-Chair Dan Kubiski, who is kind of running the show behind the scenes for us, uh, he will unmute your, micro unmute your microphone uh, so you can ask the guest directly. Please keep your questions short and concise. We want to give people, uh, as many people as possible, the chance to ask questions during the following hour. Note also, we will be recording this session and placing it on our YouTube channel later on. So people who could not join today will be able to learn from our guests uh, whenever they want to at a later time. Now, in this session, as part of Sunshine Week, we'll be talking about freedom of information laws around the world. Uh, I think Dan is posting links for other Sunshine Week events to check out if you guys want to look at the chat. Today is also the anniversary of the birth of James Madison, who penned the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights that gives us here in the United States the right and the power to demand openness in government. And with that, I will introduce uh, the two guests I have joining, joining me tonight. We have Helen Darbyshire. She is a human rights activist specializing in the right of public access to information and the development of open and democratic societies with participatory and accountable governments. She is a member of the Open Government Partnership Global Steering Committee and the advisory board of the International Open Data Charter. Helen started her career as an activist and project manager at Article 19. Afterwards, she moved to the Open Society Institute, where she directed programs on freedom of expression and freedom of information in Budapest and in New York. Helen has advised UNESCO, the Council of Europe, the OSCE, and the World Bank. She is a founder and former president of the Global Network of Freedom of Information Defenders. Helen is based in Madrid, Spain, and thank you, Helen, for joining us uh, so late uh, where you are. What time is it over there in Spain? Good evening. It's um, time to go out in Madrid, 11 o'clock. Okay, if, okay. If, if the curfew wasn't starting just now, that is at least. <laughs> right, so right. I, I had nothing better to do, you know. Here I am. Thank you <laughs> okay. so much, Hasten. It's great to be joining you for this Sunshine Week event. Great. We're, we're glad to have you. Our other guest is Adam A. Marshall. He is a senior staff attorney at the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press in Washington, D.C. His work at RCFP includes federal and state public records litigation, writing amicus briefs, and training journalists. Adam was named a Forbes 30 Under 30 in media for his work on promoting government transparency, including the development of the FOIA Wiki. Adam is the co-author of a chapter on federal FOIA in the book, Troubling Transparency, and also co-author of a chapter on public records in the book, COVID-19, The Legal Challenges. He's a very busy person. Uh, welcome to uh, the panel, Adam. Thank you so much. Also happy to be here. Good deal. All right, and with that, we'll go ahead and we will start our discussion. Uh, I'll start with two questions, one for Helen and one for Adam, and then from there, we'll just kind of see uh, who wants to uh, take the question first. Uh, we'll start with Helen, though. Uh, the United States has the Freedom of Information Act, first adopted in 1966, uh, but what about the rest of the world? How are open records handled elsewhere, and how do they compare to what we have here in our own country? Right, go ahead. Thanks very much, Hesam. Well, I know that Everyone in the US likes to think in 1966, you were pioneers. 
But I have to tell you that 200 years earlier, in 1766, uh, Sweden adopted the world's first access to information law as a constitutional provision. Uh, by the time the US Act came along, Finland had also adopted a law, but you were the third, uh, <laughs> which is pretty good. We now have around the world around 130 countries which have access to information or freedom of information laws. They really vary in quality. Uh, some of them are very good, very strong. Countries like Mexico has a very strong law. Small countries in Europe like Slova Slovenia or Albania have very strong laws. Um, uh, so we have, we have this right recognized. It's become a kind of sine qua non, something you can't do without to, be, to claim to be a democracy. Of course, having a law doesn't mean that it's well implemented and I am sure we will get on to talking about that. But that, yeah. that's, uh, that's in terms of the number of laws, Ethan. Gotcha. And a quick follow-up. Uh, are those rights seen, as, uh, laws seen as a right of citizens? Does everyone have the right to, to get those records in these other countries? Yes, absolutely. And perhaps that's the most exciting thing that's happened in the world of transparency in the last 15, 20 years. Uh, I mentioned the Swedish constitutional provision, but frankly, it took us another 250 years to catch up with that. It was only in 2006 that the first human rights court, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, recognized that access to information held by government is actually a right. It's, and they said it's a right linked to freedom of expression because we can't really enjoy a full right to freedom of expression if we don't have information. And if that information is held by government, we as the public as citizens have a right to it. That decision was followed three years later in 2009 by the European Court of Human Rights, a little bit more hesitantly, but still recognizing this right. In 2011, the uh, UN Human Rights Committee also confirmed that the right to freedom of expression, the right that journalists you all exercise in doing your work, uh, includes a right of access to information held by public bodies. There are multiple constitutions which have now confirmed that. At the EU level, the European Union in 2009, said there's a fundamental right of access to its documents. So we've seen just in the last 15 or so years, a major shift in recognizing that this isn't just an administrative privilege, which is granted by generous governments to the public. It is a right that we can actually claim. Okay, great. Uh, Adam, I uh, will go to you. I know you have done some recent research on the need to update uh, our FOIA laws here in the United States. Uh, I believe this research included looking at the Commonwealth countries and uh, Mexico. Tell us a little bit about that, Adam. Yeah, thanks. So um, <clears throat> as was mentioned, you know, the United States has had a, its national Freedom of Information uh, Act for, for about 55 years now. And there have been periodic attempts to update it uh, by Congress, in part because of the way that the administrative uh, state here has resisted its robust uh, implementation, I think, as, as Congress intended it to be. So what we've seen over the years is uh, executive branch agencies trying to withhold more and more information uh, under one or more of the Act's uh, exemptions. There are nine exemptions that are by and large pretty general. Um, you know, they may concern things like law enforcement records or personal privacy um, or uh, confidential business information. Um, in FOIA's early years, uh, agencies, so between maybe 67 and, and 1971, agencies were denying in part or in full about 1% of FOIA requests based on uh, claiming an exemption allowed them to withhold information. Uh, that number has grown uh, substantially in the numbers or in the years since. Uh, so the most recent numbers we have are from 2019. Uh, in 2019, the federal government as a whole denied in part or in full 44% of all FOIA requests based on an exemption. Um, so almost half of all FOIA requests are being uh, rejected in part or in full now because of the agency's claims. And part of the reason for that is that courts have been willing to interpret the exemptions more broadly as time has gone on. 
but also because of the nature of the exemptions. And by and large, the exemptions in the US federal FOIA are binary. Um, and what I mean by that is either the exemption applies or it doesn't apply. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, balancing or, or room for a consideration of what is the import of this material in the context of the democratic debate in the United States. Uh, so for example, with respect to exemption five, which is one of the most overused exemptions, um, there's a, 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 a privilege incorporated into exemption five called the deliberative process privilege. And this has gotten so bad that it's now become known as the withhold it because you want to privilege because it's just used every time the government wants to withhold anything that's embarrassing or inconvenient. Uh, I'll give you an example about this in the previous administration. Uh, the head of the FCC, uh, Ajit Pai, gave a, a, a speech at a conference where he made some uh, arguably very uh, bad jokes uh, about his involvement with, with industry. And someone wanted to see the drafts of his, of his speech. And the agency withheld the, the drafts of the jokes that he made uh, during this conference saying that, you know, if these, these draft jokes were released, you know, the FCC... Uh, uh, deliberations would come to a standstill and, and the agency's uh, functions would be inhibited. And it's just ludicrous. You know, it's really quite silly stuff. So one of the things that a lot of, uh, I would say, researchers, uh, civil society groups have been looking at in recent years is importing something from uh, that's a feature in other countries' public records laws, but that we don't have in the United States. And that's a public interest balancing test, or at least it's a public interest safety valve, where, uh, which, which would basically say, look, there are, there are some records where it's so important for the public to have. It's so fundamental that even if an exemption applies, there should be a, a public safety override. Um, I think an example of that is, uh, that has worked really interestingly is Mexico, actually. Um, Mexico's transparency and access to information law um, has a, a public interest override uh, that says information cannot be withheld when it concerns investigations of grave violations of fundamental rights or crimes against humanity. And in 2005, that provision was used by a group of lawyers to gain access to hundreds of pages of the indictment of a former president of Mexico who was charged uh, with genocide in connection with the killing of uh, student protesters in 1971. And it was the first time that an indictment of a high level official like that had ever been released. And it was only because of this public interest override in Mexico's law. And so I think that there needs to be something like that in the United States's law um, because there's just too much really important information that's being withheld. Excuse me. Interesting. And did you also look at the Commonwealth countries as well? Do they have a similar balancing test? Yes. Yeah, so, so a lot of, of countries around the world do have some kind of uh, uh, public uh, interest balancing test. So um, at least uh, Australia, Belgium, India, Ireland, Japan, uh, Mexico, as I mentioned, New Zealand, South Africa, and the United Kingdom. The particular contours of them uh, vary. Um, so, you know, for example, um, in the United Kingdom, there are some exemptions that the balancing test is incorporated into and other ones where it's not. Um, but I think what you see in, in the, uh, many of the com former Commonwealth countries uh, and also in, in many other uh, societies around the world is this recognition of this important principle. Um, the Council of Europe has also uh, put out uh, kind of minimum standards for, for FOI laws that recognize the importance of, of a public interest override. And uh, we're, we're, the United States is, I think, increasingly isolated and uh, in, in not recognizing that feature of FOI laws. Wow. And uh, Helen, you have some thoughts on that as well, on the, uh, on the balancing test? Yes, absolutely. I think it's a really important point that Adam has raised, because it's one of the things that makes a huge difference in being able to access information when we do have that all around the world, I mean, it's the same everywhere, the bureaucratic reflex to say no and to try to apply the exceptions, mm -hmm. even when it's very silly. I love the story about the draft jokes or maybe that's something where you are not wise to write it down really. But anyway, 
if it's written down, it's a record, you should be able to access it. So um, as Adam said, we now have actually another very exciting development. As of the 1st of December, 2020, so just two or three months ago, we have the world's first binding convention on access to official information, the Council of Europe Convention. The Council of Europe is a region wider than the European Union of 47 countries and 46 of those, I'll give a prize to anyone who can tell me which doesn't have an access to information law, but 46 of the 47 have some kind of freedom of information law, variable quality. But now in this region, we have this new binding instrument, which states not all of them yet have signed and ratified it, but it's, it's gaining a bit of momentum now that the convention is in force. Um, and that has, establishes, and it was negotiated between all those states, and I actually, as a civil society representative, participated in every single one of the drafting sessions. And I have to say that the, the exceptions weren't really that controversial, because any national governmental experts who really know about access to information know what kinds of exceptions we should have, and know that it's reasonable to say you should only refuse access to information if you can prove that it would harm that exception. So not the absolute blanket ones that you have in the US FOIA, and to balance it with the public interest. Not all of them, as, not all laws have a stronger one as the Mexican provision. Peru does, Montenegro has a bit of it, but um, at least something where you, as, as a requester, you have a chance to say, I know that that would cause harm because it would, it would be embarrassing or it would um, interfere with your decision-making process but there's a greater public interest because it reveals crimes or because it reveals corruption or because it's necessary for the public to participate, to have that information. So being able to counter the, uh, the, the assertion that there would be harm caused by releasing this information is terribly important in terms of really prizing open in countries with younger laws. And I'm sitting in a country with a law since 2014 December 2014, so really very young law, having those, the ability to argue the public interest is essential in, for journalists being able to get access to information and others as well, not only journalists, but it's something that journalists have to argue a lot. Very interesting. And what was the exception, the, the one country that didn't? Ah, I haven't seen anyone trying to reply in the, reply in the chat. Shouldn't we wait till uh, the end? I sure oh, you're, too that, yeah. you're too curious, aren't you, Heisen? I don't know how many people would have heard of it, so I'll give it away. It's the tiny country of Andorra up in the Pyrenees between France and Spain. They do have a draft law, so let's encourage Andorra to get its law adopted. <laughs> cool, huh? Okay, cool. Um, and these, these all, all sound very good on paper, uh, but as we know in the US, there's a separate issue of the practice of actually using the law, uh, applying it and seeing how that uh, how that really plays out when it's a real record trying to um, to get, especially a record that could be potentially embarrassing to someone uh, in a high-ranking position. So how well are open record laws uh, implemented in practice uh, across Europe? The, the short answer is we don't really know. There is so, we can measure the quality of the laws on paper, but there is so little information about really how well they're implemented. Adam, you've been doing your research in Mexico and in Mexico, you have the wonderful um, national transparency portal where you can see 1.7 million requests, which is two thirds of all requests that have ever been filed in Mexico. And you can really see which ones have been answered and how well and that makes transparency transparent. We don't have that in a lot of countries in Europe. In France, the body that's charged with hearing appeals knows how many appeals they get a year, around 5,000 a year, they have no idea how many requests are filed because nobody's counting. So that's a real challenge. It's something that we're working on a lot now. The um, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has done a survey amongst its members. There's a lot of data being collected in the, um, in the Americas and UNESCO is charged under the Sustainable Development Goals with also collecting information. So it's a bit frustrating because then one gets into very sort of anecdotal stories about, well, I got this in this country, I didn't get it in another country. To give you a sort of banal example, um, one thing that we sort of, uh, I, I like to use as an example, restaurant inspections, which I believe are available in the US, in most yeah. parts of the US. Yeah. 
Well, they're available in the UK, they're available in France, but they were difficult to get in Germany. They're not, they've, we've only just got some of them in Spain. They're not available in other countries, Italy. So every single piece of information you take, you'll see a, a variation around Europe. The Nordic countries, which have this long over 200 year history of doing openness and doing transparency, it's very good. You can find out your neighbor's tax returns, which for most people, certainly in Southern Europe would be shocking. Um, it, then it gets a bit piecemeal. Someone's won a case in one country and we're just doing, we're just doing some, uh, some litigation in Spain right now uh, on information that New York Times journalists were looking for a, in Europe a couple of years ago, which is the spending of money on farm subsidies. Uh, 10 countries around Europe gave us the data Spain didn't, we're litigating. Germany didn't, we're thinking of litigating. So you try to piece it together, but it's very hard to say which country is really best overall. Perhaps the Nordics are best, but that's, you know, not really a, with hard data to prove my point. Gotcha. And yeah, Ellen, go, oh, ahead. go ahead, Adam. I, I was just going to say that um, Ellen's uh, description is, is strikingly familiar to me because it really reminds me of the states uh, in the United States. Um, at the federal level, we do have very good data about what has, has happened. And there is, you know, by and large consistency across the, the federal government. Um, but the states are a whole nother matter uh, in the US. So every state has their own public records law, some of which are modeled after the federal FOIA, but some of which are, are not. Um, there's very little information available on what states are doing. And in fact, as, as Helen said, the same type of information may be available in one state and may be, not be available in another state. And it's it's quite bizarre. So, you know, during COVID-19, for example, we've seen a lot of people interested in things like autopsy records or coroner's reports. And they're routinely made available in some states and not available in other states. And for anyone trying to do journalistic uh, you know, work on, on what is happening in the United States, it's incredibly frustrating that these laws are so inconsistent. Um, so it, it, it was funny to, to hear mm -hmm. you, you say that because it, it does remind me of, um, of you know, these, these state level idiosyncratic uh, uh, oddities that we have. Totally, Adam. And I actually, of course, you find that within any country. The central government may be doing much better, but you go to some municipality in some more remote area and everyone's saying they can't get the minutes of the latest council meeting. Um, so, it, in, I mean, the, the, in the US, you have the advantage of having had the, the FOIA for longer, as you say, 55 years, but 56, something like that now, 55. The, um, in countries in Europe, which have much newer laws, because most of them are, I mean, from the late 1990s onwards um, and countries like Spain, even much younger, um, it's a huge cultural shift and you have to train all your bureaucrats. A lot of work has been done and the Open Government Partnership of which I'm a, a member of the Global Steering Committee really encourages countries to make commitments to advance both in practice and also doing things like training. So, but there's a lot of work you need to do to actually get your public administrations to understand that the documents they hold, they're holding for and on behalf of the public. And these documents, if you like, belong to the public. I'm sure many people watching can sort of sympathize. I've been in Argentina doing a training where a public official literally cradled his document saying, yeah, but this is my file. It's my file. <laughs> So it's, uh, yeah, it's a challenge. Uh, how about that? Um, we'll go to our first uh, audience question with that. This is from Stephen Goodman and it's for Helen. Uh, it says, Helen, I realize you've been talking about countries. Could you say a word or two about FERPA style efforts that universities in Europe might or might not use to refuse sharing information? Thank you very much for the question. I've had to very quickly Google FERPA. <laughs> because I didn't know what it was, I have to confess, but it seems to be some kind of right of having access to your own educational records, is that right? So it, it both um, provides an access to your own educational records, but also restricts the disclosure of other types of educational records. Um, and it's a, it's a huge mm -hmm. 
uh, headache for, for journalists in the US who are trying to get any records from, for example, public universities. Um, usually they, they just reflexively say, oh, there's this federal law, FERPA. It says we can't give out anything, but that's not actually what, uh, what the law says. It's, it's more cabined, but frequently cited to deny uh, records requests about uh, educational institutions. It sounds kind of like HIPAA uh, with healthcare records, right? It, it's it's a, of a HIPAA I've come across. Yes, yes. it's similar. <laughs> right. Well, I think we have a slightly different legal structure because we have uh, a real clear divide in Europe between, I'm talking more like the European Union, although it's, it's a bit wider than that. We have the right of access to information and access to information laws, but then you have data protection rules, which separately, and usually older regimes, in fact, give you a right to request your own information. So it's a different channel with different time frames, different procedures, and usually a different oversight body that will rule on any appeals. A data protection agency as opposed to an information commissioner. Sometimes they're a, a single body, but they have these dual responsibilities which are really governed by different legal frameworks. So if you're trying to get access to your own records, um, then it would be under the data protection rules and it's an entirely different thing. Um, the question of whether you can get other information from universities varies hugely. Um, I don't have the specific data on that. I've got it for some other things like the judicial and legislative branches, but which not all European laws cover. Um, only half of the ones in the, 40, uh, the 46 I mentioned, only about 23 of them cover the judicial branch. I, I don't know off the top of my head how many cover universities, educational institutions, but not all of them by any means. So in the UK, where I come from, universities, education is seen as a, a as something, even a private educational establishment would have to respond to information requests. That's definitely not the case, I would say, in most of Europe. Um, I don't know if I'm really ans asking Steve's specific question there, but if you want any follow up on a particular country, I'm happy to look into it. Um, but, you know, as I say, these laws are younger and we're still really battling to get established access to information from the, the, the core government bodies in many cases. So things that perhaps in the US you've managed to extend it a bit is not always not always been achieved. But the right of access to your own records is incredibly strong in Europe. There's no doubt about that. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see, we'll go to our next question. Um, I was under the impression going into tonight that the United States had the first ever uh, freedom of information law. I have learned that I'm off by a full 200 years. So uh, yep, I've already learned something valuable tonight. So, so with that said, uh, how does uh, US policy with regard to open records uh, influence the rest of the world when it comes to uh, access to information? I think that the, the, the US Freedom of Information Act was particularly influential in the transitions. I worked a lot uh, during the, the, the 90s and the early 2000s in getting access to information, freedom of information laws adopted in the new democracies of Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and there were a lot of people who knew of and were inspired by the US Freedom of Information Act. There are films, I mean, there are films, I think there's two films where Julia Roberts uses the Freedom of Information Act. Everyone in Central Eastern Europe seems to have seen those films. Um, so it's part of your, it's, it's, it's such a thing in the US that it's part of your popular culture. And that is something which did get to Central and Eastern Europe. The, the Nordic model of openness as well, very much. And in those countries, in their moments of transition, when information had been the weapon of oppression, the use of information by the Stasi, for anyone who's seen that fantastic film, The Lives of Others, and know, you know the, the, the real importance of information um, and its control in Central and Eastern Europe, there was a huge demand for uh, the, having these, these laws as part of the transitional uh, institutions, instruments that were put in place. What's interesting is that many countries in Central and Eastern Europe went further than the US and actually got into their constitutions. Hungary was the first one, uh, got into their constitutions a right of access to information. So that has made it a constitutional right. And then um, 
it's been a bit later that countries in Western Europe that hadn't already got these rules updated them. France did from 1978, the Netherlands from 1978. Um, so that, that was already happening. And then the next sort of wave of in the 2000s uh, that Adams looked at in, in starting with Mexico and Peru in 2002, 2003 with their laws, very much referencing the US law. And yet again, going further because of the importance, the recognition of the importance of information uh, in, in, in Latin America to fight against corruption, to, to have a right to truth about the crimes that are being committed in the recent past. Um, so definitely it's been, a, it's been a, an inspiration, uh, but it's interesting to see how people have gone further than it. Yeah, and that was going to be my uh, my next question. Oh, sorry, I anticipate. No, you're you're fine. You're, we're on the same uh, the same track. Is yeah, what can the U.S. learn now uh, from these other countries? What are some important things that they're doing that the U.S. Uh, should do? We've already talked about a few of them, but if you have any any other uh, points you'd like to make there, yes, I think that uh, definitely having the harm and public interest test for every single exception is absolutely essential. Um, I think one of the other things that we've seen work incredibly well around Europe, in, in places like India, uh, in, in countries in Latin America, is having a strong independent institution, an information commissioner or, or commission, which oversees and can rule on uh, appeals uh, brought by members of the public, citizens, uh, against refusals. And there are, there are multiple advantages to having a specialized institution. One is that they're specialized. They know what they're talking about. They know their own jurisprudence. They really are focused on this, this really important democratic right. Another is that it's usually easier to use and faster than the court system. So, I mean, I've, I've done it myself, you know, taken, taken appeals to different information commissioners around Europe. I've never had to take one in, but if I wanted to, I could go to the, uh, National Institute for Access to Information in Mexico without needing a lawyer, without having to pay anything. And that's a very agile mechanism by which uh, citizens can defend this right, which is a right that all of us have, in fact. So I, I would say that those are two things that the US could possibly learn. Adam, anything it, I can add? Go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I, I completely agree. One of the... Um, one of the things that the U.S. did in 2007 was try, try to do something, I think, along the lines of what Helen was, was discussing mm. with the creation yes. of the Office of Government Information Services, OGIS, uh, which is housed within the National Archives. Um, unfortunately, I do not think uh, the, our, our attempt went nearly far enough. So OGIS has a few roles, but one of them is it is supposed to be able to mediate disputes between uh, requesters and agencies. Unfortunately, it has um, essentially no power. Uh, it, it doesn't have yeah. any power to compel the agency to even participate in, in the process. So the agency uh, can simply say, no, uh, we're not, we're not going to, we're not going to play ball. Um, and OGIS has no uh, power to compel the release of, of records, even if it thinks that they are improperly withheld. Um, so un unfortunately, I don't think uh, OGIS is, is often looked to as a mechanism uh, to get a, a recalcitrant agency to, to open up its books. Um, you, you often do have to go uh, to court. One interesting thing that I'll, I'll note though, that is being, well, it's, it's been in place for, I think a couple of years now um, in Ohio, actually, believe it or not. Uh, the, the Ohio public records law has a new provision that allows for what I'll call baby uh, judicial review. Um, it allows any member of the public to pay a $25 filing fee. Um, and then you have a magistrate uh, in the Ohio court system review the request, uh, do mediation, um, and everything is done on the briefs. You don't have to be a lawyer. Uh, there's no discovery. There's nothing like that. It's, it's not full-fledged litigation, but it is independent review by um, by a neutral uh, official. And I think there's absolutely room for more, uh, more development along those lines at the federal level because lawyers are expensive and mm -hmm. FOIA litigation takes a long time. Um, and it's really not good for anyone, right? I mean, if you're in 
uh, litigation, probably the system has broken down somewhere. And that's why it can be a little discouraging to see how often uh, requesters are forced to go to the courts um, over things just like delays. Uh, I, I really think it would be better if we had a system where there were multiple opportunities to resolve those disputes without courts. Yeah, and that's a great uh, segue into my next question. If we're talking about lawyers and uh, litigation, especially unnecessary litigation, uh, we had a recent high profile case here in the United States uh, that came when Louisiana Attorney General Jeff uh, Landry uh, sued a reporter for filing open records requests. Uh, she tried to get records, they stalled, they said there was an open investigation, and then they sued her uh, trying to cite privacy um, for filing uh, an open records request. Uh, SPJ, I'm proud to say, awarded Landry the 2021 Black Hole Award earlier this week. <laughs> it's a, the award that goes to the uh, worst violation of open records laws in the country over the entire year. Uh, he was a well-deserved uh, recipient of, of that um, dishonor. But, but uh, with all that said, as disturbing as this case is, uh, it's actually somewhat uh, more common than some people think. Uh, Adam, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. Um, and this is part of a, a bigger trend that we've seen in the United States over the last uh, few years in, in particular, which are these non-traditional uh, lawsuits. So the usual course in the United States is that uh, the requester will make a request uh, either the agency gives all of the information or they say, no, we, we can withhold part of it. Uh, usually there's some type of administrative uh, review process. Um, but then if there is still information being withhold, uh, that's uh, it. Uh, the, the process stops unless the requester takes the option of going to court and, and seeking further judicial review. What you had happen in, in uh, Louisiana and what you're starting to see more and more uh, across the United States is the government taking the requester to court and seeking essentially a, a preemptory declaration from courts that the information that the requester is seeking is exempt. Uh, and that is really troubling for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, because it requires the requester, if they're gonna defend themselves, they have to find counsel they will probably have to expend money, uh, you know, unless they can find someone to do it pro bono. Um, these things can be uh, uh, scary in terms of taking up a lot of time and, and mental energy, right? You're now a defendant in a lawsuit. It may subject you to all kinds of things like costs, attorney's fees. You may be subject to, uh, to discovery requests. Um, all, all types of things can flow from being a defendant. You might, you might have to like check off a box, you know, right. When you're applying to things in the future, have you ever been sued? Uh, you know, and you have to, you might have to say, yes, I was sued by the state of, of Louisiana or, or, and then, uh, you know, then your employer might be like, or your housing provider be like, why were you sued by the state? Um, all kinds of things may flow from this. So we, we agree. And, and we filed an amicus brief actually in that case, um, because we, we thought it was so uh, pernicious and, and really upsetting. But you're seeing more and more of that. You're also seeing more lawsuits filed by third parties, um, usually business entities who do not want the government to release information. So this is a, a variant, right, where you have a, a third party, usually a company, suing the government. And then that may force the requester to try to intervene in the litigation to defend their interests. Uh, so you have all kinds of unusual uh, litigation postures developing now. Um, and in, in ways that I, I think are not, <laughs> are not how public records laws are supposed to function. Uh, usually if there's gonna be some kind of judicial review, it should be at the option of the requester, uh, not the government. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've got about 20 minutes left. A uh, quick reminder to uh, those watching to please ask some questions. We only had one so far. Uh, we have two very uh, distinguished uh, panelists here who'd be happy to answer your questions. So please uh, submit those if you have anything you'd, you'd like them to talk about. Um, let's see, on the topic of, uh, of delays where the requester is the one maybe um, trying to push the envelope, uh, what kind of timeframes are there normally for asking uh, for accessing information 
uh, in Europe. In the US, it depends, it varies by state. It can go between three days and sometimes it'll just say a reasonable time period. Uh, some places will go all the way up to 90 days, which in my opinion is, uh, is egregious. But what are the timelines mm -hmm. like uh, in Europe? Thanks. The average uh, across the, the laws in Europe is 15 working days, which is the time frame that we also have to get answers from the European Union. Usually the laws allow uh, a one-off extension of that for maybe another 15 working days. Um, so you, you're talking about maximum uh, sort of three weeks a month for, for an initial answer, and then the government body would have to actually justify extending that uh, for let's say another three weeks or a month. Um, at that point, if you haven't received the information, you can go to your, if you have one, an information commissioner, or you could go to court to challenge the, uh, what would be termed administrative silence if they haven't answered you within the time frame. I, I am aware and I hear often about the kinds of time frames in the US and they seem horrifically long to me sometimes um, because you can get, if you don't have an answer within the time frame stipulated in the law, in most European countries, you can get a resolution. Now your, your appeal, your court case might take a little bit longer. And sometimes court cases can very, get very drawn out, but you would really hope to have information uh, more rapidly. It does depend on the country, uh, the Nordic countries, which are, Sweden I think is one of the only countries which doesn't actually specify the time frame and says something like as soon as possible, but they've generally, and the jurisprudence has recognized that it should be around five days. And they're very good. I've had answers from Sweden and Denmark in, in 24, 48 hours, from Finland once in 24 hours. So it's really very impressive. Italy, in monitoring that we've done, has a terrible rate of administrative silence. We did one, we did one report where we filed requests across the country. And within the initial one month time frame, 73% of them had not been answered. That was four years ago. So um, we do have a challenge with getting answers. Um, but I would say it's not the same kind of problem as you do, you know, that you have in the, in the US, which seems to be something that's almost accepted that it takes longer than it should. Uh, I just want to make a quick comment on what Adam was saying about these uh, lawsuits against the requesters. I find that absolutely mind blowing. I, I can't think of, of examples of that happening or that that could even possibly happen in Europe. Third parties who, knowing that a government body is about to release information which affects them and think that it might damage their commercial interests, have a right to go to court, and that seems to me entirely legitimate. And it sometimes happened, happens. There are one or two cases where the European Union was going to release information and people were, or had actually uh, been publishing information proactively and affected third parties went to court businesses who are affected by the disclosure of this information, but actually kind of attacking the requester like that is something that I can't imagine. I, I mean, maybe if we have time comment about one killing of a journalist in 2018, which seems to have been linked to a freedom of information request. If I can just bring that up now, because I wanted to mention it, because I do think it's something or may, people may have heard of. And Jan Kuciak, a Slovak journalist, was killed in 2000, February 2018, a young journalist. And it seems that he did put rather naively, perhaps, and rather stupidly, one might say, for more experienced uh, requesters, put quite a lot of the details of his investigation into his request. Mm -hmm. um, and that may have been the trigger that uh, led to the, probably the Italian mafia linked to people in the Slovak government. The government fell after that killing. It was a big scandal. Um, at that time, we did sort of ask around in terms of the reprisals that journalists get for filing information. And I had a case of a Spanish journalist working for a large newspaper here who told me that she'd filed a request for a project that she was working on on her own. And then lo and behold, that someone in the ministry had phoned her boss and said, what's your journalist doing digging into that story? Can you get her off it? And the boss didn't even know because it was something the journalist was doing in her spare time. So. Uh, you know, that, that kind of thing can happen, I, I, and I'm sure it does. Um, a bit of pressure, particularly on journalists who are filing requests. We try to give advice to journalists to hide your requests. If you're interested in one particular 
procurement contract as for the whole month's worth, so you don't give your game away. Um, it's it's an issue, um, but litigation like that, I no, never heard of it. Absolutely, that's so funny, Helen. I I, I when I do training of journalists. Um, I often give uh, the same advice. <laughs> Do you know? Great. Yes. Um, and, and in particular in the national security context, because I think yes. one thing that is uh, potentially dangerous uh, for, for journalists um, is you may have a source within, within the government, a confidential source that lets you know uh, something. And then you may be interested in, in trying to you know, get a, a, a clean copy right through, yes, through the totally. public records law. Um, but the pro- a problem can arise when you go to say a national uh, security type agency and you say, you know, I'd like a copy of the following very highly classified record and then you use the exact title of yeah. the document. Um, and the agency may say, that's interesting. How do they know the title of this very top secret uh, document? Um, so I that is something that I like to tell uh, journalists that I'm, I'm working with is, you know, be maybe a little circumspect, especially in the national security context about how much information you're giving away in your records requests. Totally, absolutely. And I, I, I pulled some stats. I know we were talking about delay uh, just before this. I wanted to highlight uh, two agencies that, that uh, illustrate, I think the delay that uh, people in the United States face. Um, so the FBI's oldest request has now been pending for almost, or actually, I'm sorry, for more than 2,000 days. Um, and the oldest request at the Department of Defense uh, has been pending since 2009. Uh, so the very beginning of the Obama administration, uh, around 2,700 days that that request has been pending. But how do they get away with it, Adam? I mean, does, don't people go to court and the courts take a decision? Uh, so uh, you you can as as you you mentioned if if the agency doesn't respond within the the time frame that they have which is usually twenty working days in the U S you can file a lawsuit um, but some people may not have the means or or the ability yeah. to do that um, you do have to usually have a lawyer um, or or pay a filing fee um, and uh, some uh, you know people obviously haven't uh, haven't challenged these. Um, but it, it is an extraordinary amount of time uh, re- for any request. Yes, you know, it's incredible. Uh, incredible. It's, it's really, really quite uh, distressing. Wow. Uh, we have one more question from the audience, probably is going to be our last question of the evening. It is from incoming SPJ National President, Rebecca Aguilar. Uh, are we going to flip it over to Rebecca for to ask her question, Dan? Okay, I'll just go ahead and read it myself since I'm not seeing any, any movement here. It says there are several U.S. government agencies who are now using platforms like Slack uh, to communicate. Can journalists request those Slack conversations or is that a way for the government to keep information out of the hands of the public or the press? Uh, well, the, the short answer is uh, yes, you, you can request those Slack in, uh, conversations. And uh, yes, they they may be uh, used to to at least try to keep information out of the press. Um, FOIA is actually quite good in that it doesn't really um, uh, matter the the format or the medium in which the information is stored, as long as it's it's you know can be reproduced uh, in some way, and the information is is fixed, right? You're not so things like phone calls you can't FOIA into a phone call, right? Uh, but as long as there's a recording of the phone call or there's a chat log or an email on whatever server, as long as it's an agency record, um, it is subject to FOIA. Something you might run into with these uh, more temporal modes of communication is the record retention schedule, though. And the record retention schedule may be shorter for certain types of transitory uh, communications. Um, and, and FOIA only provides you access to what exists. Um, if it's been deleted um, under the record retention schedule, it no longer exists and, and you don't uh, have a right of access to it. Um, but but yes, yeah, Slack, Slack uh, communications are, are definitely subject to FOIA. Um, and I'm sure there's some very, very inf- interesting uh, uh, information on them. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what the law is in, in, in Europe in terms of these kind of new modes of communication, certainly here in the U.S., we went through 
probably the, the greatest FOIA scandal of, of modern times with former uh, Secretary Clinton's uh, private mm. email server. Yes. Yeah. Um, but ha- are, are things, have, have the laws there grappled with these other forms of communication? Um, the, the, the definitions in the laws are usually very good. Any information recorded in any format, great. But one thing is what the law says, and another thing what the bureaucratic mind perceives to be a document. And that usually has to have a number, probably someone's had to sign it, stamp it ideally. Um, I'm exaggerating a bit, but not that much, I tell you. So uh, we do have this huge challenge. Um, We've had to fight in different countries and it's very patchy. And I I think I find it very hard to generalize with this, Um, but getting Excel sheets, a few years ago was a challenge in some countries. Getting emails is something that, you know, sometimes it still gets questioned. It still gets questioned, even in you know, developed Western European countries. Oh, but emails aren't documents. Yes, they are, they're documents. Um, so we have those kinds of challenges we're still grappling with. And then we have these new forms of communication where I, I would say we haven't really got as far as the US or even one or two countries in Latin America in, in, where there's been jurisprudence saying you can get access um, to other forms of communication. There, there are probably examples of where such things have been released, but it's not the norm by any means. What we're, the, the line that we're taking from Access Info and that we've looked into is the obligations to actually keep a record of how decisions are taken. Um, and to, to ensure that the reasoning behind any decision, which is what you're usually trying to get at, um, is uh, is something that uh, is recorded. And we've, in our mapping of the rules about recording decision making around Europe, we found that there's really a very, it's just something you do traditionally, but there's a very weak framework for actually saying you have to record the process of taking the decision and how it was taken. I have, I did have one court case trying to get information from the European Commission. And all we learned in court, we didn't get the documents, but we learned in court that they were document, they were emails exchanged very late at night containing political opinions, as if exchanging emails late at night was something that somehow exempted them from the <laughs> from, from the scope of the reach of an access to information regime. Um, so it's something I think that globally we still have to work on. There have been some other really exciting developments in France. The, the Commission on Access to Documents has now clearly established that an algorithm is a document. So you can actually ask for the source code and the algorithm, which I think is really important because so many more decisions have been taken by algorithms. And that's the kind of thing we're also discussing with other governments around Europe right now. Thanks, Rebecca. That was a, an important question, actually, because this is our, our 21st century challenge as our means of communications change so rapidly. And and the real danger is that decision making, um, an important uh, historical record escapes from the the, the more traditional classic document written record. Right, absolutely. All right, and with that, we have about five minutes left. We have time for one final question for each of our guests. Uh, We'll start with Helen. What does press freedom mean to you? Without freedom of information, there's no press freedom. So it definitely means open government. Okay, and Adam, uh, same question. What does, broadly speaking, what does press freedom mean to you? Press freedom means ensuring that the public has the information that they need to participate in a democratic society. I believe that freedom of information laws are just as integral to ensuring a democratic way of life as other parts of uh, the United States Constitution um, or, or other traditions that we, we hold dear here. Um, and I think they're, they're really at the, the bedrock of ensuring uh, that our form of government is maintained. Yeah, big plus one, Adam. I think it's really important. And I think the pandemic year, we really saw the importance of the role of journalists in ensuring that the public is informed. And if we'd forgotten the importance of press freedom, I think maybe the pandemic helped us remember that as well. Yes, it's true. I mean, um, you know, in the US at least, the official uh, recording, for example, of even the number of cases um, in different jurisdictions 
was not being uh, handled by the federal government in a, in a satisfactory way. And so it was the New York Times, it was Reuters, it was um, you know local state uh, and and even uh, hyper local journalistic entities that were doing the grunt work in terms of yeah. just doing things like recording the, the number of cases. Um, uh, you know that's changed a little bit now. There's better better federal uh, data data gathering and distribution. Um, but if I ever have a question, you know, about what is the status of of COVID somewhere, um, I I go to the New York Times and, yeah. and not the CDC. Um. All right, well, we'll leave it at that. I want to thank Helen and Adam uh, so much for being with us tonight. This was an extremely informative uh, session. I actually learned a lot myself, even serving as the moderator. Um, the next IC Talk will be on April 30th. We'll be talking with Beth Mendelson. Uh, she's the executive producer of Turkey, Breaking the Silence. That is a Voice of America documentary, which profiles citizens, journalists, and activists whose stories help explain the forces which are driving media suppression in, country, uh, in Turkey. Uh, you can get more information about that and sign up for the session at the International Community website, which Dan should be posting in the chat window now. You can also get updates about IC Talks by signing on to receive the International Community's weekly newsletter at the IC uh, website and on its Facebook page. Again, thank you to Adam and Helen, and thanks to everyone who joined us tonight. Uh, that'll be it. Thanks, Hasten, Adam. It was a great pleasure. Likewise. Bye, everyone. Bye. Uh, thank you.